This is the second half of the first lecture for uh, algebra-based physics. And this might be one of the most important lectures of the entire course, or maybe even the entire two semesters. Um, because in order to do the physics of mechanics and electricity and magnetism that you'll do in the second semester, you need to know how to deal with vector equations, meaning that the laws of physics are written as vector equations. And um, vectors and vector algebra is simply a, a technique in mathematics. So basically today what we'll be doing is we'll be learning that method of mathematics that you probably didn't learn um, in the courses that you've taken already. Um, so we need to learn this, this idea and, and these techniques in order to do the physics that we're going to do today uh, and, and continue through the rest of the semester. Um, so just a, a quick overview of what we'll talk about. We'll talk about how physical quantities, the kinds of things that you measure as a physicist, could be either scalar or vectors uh, and give some examples. Um, then I'll do a little example um, uh, which we'll, we'll follow up on in later lectures of, um, that I hope sort of introduces what we mean by vectors and vector manipulation. Um, then uh, introduce the, the main rules about vectors, which is that you can add them together and that you can multiply them by scalars, by numbers. Um, and then we'll introduce uh, what, are, what are called coordinate systems, uh, which are just x, y uh, axes that you're used to, uh, unit vectors, and then that will give us components of vectors, which will be probably the main way that we deal with vectors. Um, and finally, we'll relate um, the magnitude of a, of a vector and its direction to those components. We talked last time about measurement and about um, how you can write down a number for the measurement you make, and that's true for many uh, measurements that you might make. So here are a couple examples. You might take a, a ruler up to a table, and you might find that this table is maybe 1.7 meters long. So the length of it, L, is equal to 1.7 meters. So that measurement is represented by a single number. Um, if you look down at your speedometer, you'll see um, that maybe it's uh, 57 miles per hour. Uh, again, the speed, so this is length, this is uh, speed of a car, is a single number. Um, and of course, your weight, if you stand on a scale, you might see that that's uh, 167 pounds, a single number. So the weight of an object is represented by a single number. But if you think a little bit, you can, you can think of a lot of other physical quantities that, that need more than one number. Um, so, for example, in a river, you might uh, drop a piece of paper in there and watch it flow, and maybe over here you'll see that once you drop the paper, it moves in this direction uh, with that arrow. And maybe if you use a stopwatch and a ruler, you can find that it's moving, for example, um, you know, 1.5 meters per second, but in a particular direction. So the number 1.5 meters per second is not enough information. Maybe over here, it changes direction. So now it's moving in this way, and maybe over here it's, it's 2 meters per second. So it's faster, and it's also going in a different direction than it was before. Uh, if you throw a ball, uh, that the way that you throw it has to do with how fast you throw it, its speed, which is just a number, but also the direction, so that the trajectory that it takes initially, we might call this the initial velocity, um, and the initial velocity may have, a, or will have a speed, and a direction to it. So, um, so we look at these things as uh, quantities that need to be represented by more than one number, and we'll call them vector quantities. We can think about them as requiring either a magnitude, meaning sort of a strength, or in the way that it's represented on the arrows, the length of the arrow, and a direction. Or you could also think about it, and we'll talk about this at the end, as an amount in each direction. So, for instance, this ball is being thrown uh, 
both upwards and over, and you can sort of find the two components of that motion, the two components of its velocity. And we'll make that precise as we go along. Um, so let's do just a little quick example that sort of shows what you might do with vectors. Um, so we said, okay, a river might have um, a, a velocity to it. Let's, let's say that the river has a velocity that's exactly horizontal on the page. And um, we'll say that that's the V river, the velocity of the river. Um, and that vector, um, that arrow, uh, represents the vector. Uh, what we can say is we can say that the it points to the right, but it has a magnitude of, for example, 3 meters per second. Another way that we could write that is just the river without the arrow over top is equal to 3 meters per second. That's a way of representing the length of a vector or the strength of a vector. Now maybe you want to go uh, swim in the river, so uh, you, you run in, you dive over here, and you start swimming. like this, and maybe over in the cove you are able to swim where there's no current whatsoever, and you're able to swim with uh, a velocity in this direction uh, of a V swim of 1 meter per second. So you might ask the question, well what happens if you're swimming along in that direction and you encounter the river. What will be the velocity of you after, after that happens? Well, we'll do that precisely in the section called relative velocity that's coming up in a, in a few days. Um, but it turns out that what happens is that you can simply add the two vectors together. And um, the way that we add them together is you take one vector and you draw it. So this is your V swim vector. And then you take the second vector and you put its tail at the head of the first vector. So this is V river. And the result, which is the vector that goes from the beginning to the end, will be v swim nu, meaning the velocity that the swimmer will have with respect to the earth here um, after they hit that current. So you may still be pointing yourself off to the left and upwards trying to swim that way, but because the river is stronger, uh, it will start pulling you in the other direction. You'll end up simply swimming in that, in that direction. So that's a useful thing. You can sort of see what will happen if you um, hit the river here and you go along the direction of that vector, then you'll actually end up going over here and you might land at this point on the bank. Uh, and we'll be able to do problems like that. So um, we see that a, a vector has length and direction. Uh, the length is called the magnitude. Um, we see that you can take two vectors and add them together and that will often have some physical meaning, um, in particular when we talk about relative velocity problems. Um, the other thing you can do is you can multiply a vector by a number. So you might say, well, the river is going three meters per second today, but maybe tomorrow it will go half as fast. And so you simply divide uh, the magnitude by three meters per second. And what that means is, well, let's say, so the river tomorrow is equal to V river today divided by 2. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the vector that was this long becomes this long. It simply changes the magnitude of it. Uh, if you multiply by a negative number or divide by a negative number, then the direction of it will flip. And we'll, we'll see that later.
Um, so just a quick word about how we manipulate vectors. Um, once you draw a, a vector picture, once you draw one of these arrows, you don't want to change it at all. Meaning, um, if I draw a picture of a river and I draw an arrow in it showing the, the velocity of the river at that point, well, that is the velocity of the river at that point. If I somehow twist that arrow around, then it will change what I already said was the velocity. So I don't want to do that. So what you're allowed to do is you're allowed to slide the vector. So I'm just going to use my tablet to do that. So erase the extraneous stuff. So here's my vector. And I can, without rotating it or without lengthening it, there it was, I can move it over and place it on a coordinate system. And uh, we'll be doing that in order to find what are the, called the components of the vector, which allow us to calculate things. Uh, but you could also do it to do the sort of manipulation that we were doing up here, um, where you took one vector and added it to another vector. So moving a vector around on the page by sliding it is perfectly fine, as long as you don't change um, the direction of the vector or its magnitude. So um, the, the basic ideas about vectors can be thought of simply in the manipulation of these arrows. And we're going to introduce um, the two main properties of vectors using these arrows. And then we'll show how that, um, well, we'll show basically in the entire semester how we use those techniques to actually solve problems. Um, but as I said at the beginning, this is a math uh, subject, and so we're basically just learning that math subject right now. So you need to know how to do graphical addition, which is what we'll do on this page, and how scalar multiplication works, which just means multiplying a vector by a number. So um, let's look at these three vectors that are given as an example up at the top of the page. And we'll try and calculate some quantities uh, related to their sum or their multiplication and sum or, or their subtraction. Uh, note that there's no multiplication of vectors and there's no division of vectors. Those things don't have any sense. All that we can do is add vectors and multiply them by numbers. So uh, first one is to take to find the vector d which is equal to uh, the vector a plus b. So let's grab those two vectors. Okay. And um, the way that you do graphical addition, I already showed it when we did the river, is you take one vector, and you might want to give yourself a coordinate system to start with. It's sort of nice to sort of place the whole thing on a coordinate system. Although, as we saw from the example with um, the, the river, it wasn't necessary to do that. And then you take the second vector and you place its tail at the head of the first vector. And the resultant, so the name that we give to the sum of them, is called the resultant. The resultant vector goes from the beginning to the end. And it's important, you just have to memorize that. Um, you don't want it to go from the end to the beginning. It always goes from the beginning to the end. And I guess that's why I draw the coordinate system is because it comes off of the origin and goes out to the last head. So this is the vector d. And we sometimes call, or we often call, the sum of vectors uh, the resultant. OK, uh, let's try another one. Uh, we have a plus b plus c. So let's do a plus b plus c. Um, now we need to grab C as well. So um, if we take a coordinate system, um, it turns out that vector addition is commutative. So I don't have to do the order in the same way every time. So let's just check that. Take our vector b, and we'll start with it, and then take vector a and place its tail at the head of vector b. And you can see that if I were to stop at this point, I would get um, a vector that goes here, which is exactly what we found for the sum of a plus b. So b plus a is equal to a plus b.
But we're not stopping there. We're now going to add C, and I guess I need to move this to give myself a little more space. If I add C, I have to go to here. And where is my resultant vector now? Well, it goes from the beginning, from the origin, to the end, to the last head, and this is what we call the vector E. And you see, you see that these vectors are conspired to give us a completely vertical vector when you add the three of them together. Okay, let's do another one. Um, a plus 2B. Um, so let's grab A and B again. So now we have, um, let's draw our coordinate system. So there's A, uh, and we're told to add 2B to it. Well, A plus 2B, um, addition works just like you expect it to, um, and scalar multiplication works just as you might expect it for numbers, is actually equal to B plus B. Um, so what we can do is we can take two versions of B, and we can add them together like this, and our resultant vector will go from the beginning to the end. So this is the vector f. And finally, last example, b minus a. g is going to be equal to b minus a. Well, um, that minus sign is just another example of scalar multiplication. Um, so let's move this out of the way. So uh, g is equal to b minus a is just b plus minus 1 times a. And maybe that doesn't uh, help us very much. But what we saw over here is that um, multiplying b by 2 gives us twice the length of b. It gives us two b's. Multiplying a by minus 1 will not change the length at all, but the minus sign will flip it around. That's the meaning of the negative sign. So if we do that, then we have um, b, and then we add not a, but we want to add a vector that goes in exactly the opposite direction. The minus a vector. So take that vector and add it here. And on our coordinate system here, we find that our resultant will go from the beginning to the end, like so. And that vector I think we call g. So that's the method of graphical addition. And it, it's simple. I'm sure that you think it's simple as you're just watching me do it. You need to practice it a few times, and you need to remember it, because we're going to use that method throughout the course. And it's important to remember how to do it, and also uh, the, the very last step, how to write down the resultant vector. So in order to use vectors, um, we will often want to make just number equations out of them, so scalar equations. Um, you notice that the whole way that I presented the rules of vectors was just completely graphical in nature in the previous page. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to do calculations with vector equations, and we'll need to get numbers out of those vectors. So the way that we do that is we use a rectangular coordinate system, uh, which is just the, the standard xy coordinate system that you see here. Um, and what we'll find are what are called the components of a vector. So in order to sort of derive this idea, we need to see how we construct a vector, just some arbitrary vector like this v vector here, from the coordinate system. And what I mean by that is that we'll define something called unit vectors. So these are unit vectors, and they're vectors that have a magnitude 1. That's why they're called unit vectors. We write them as i hat and j hat. Uh, you might sometimes see them as x hat and y hat. Um, and they define the coordinate system that you've chosen. So you, you write down a coordinate system on a page, like I did here, and that defines the x direction and the y direction, which means that I can draw 
the unit vectors. This is the i hat vector and the j hat vector. Okay, so those are the unit vectors. They're length one vectors that point along the coordinate system that you've chosen. Well, what does that have to do with anything? The idea is that you can then construct this vector from the sum of unit vectors. So let's move it over and place it at our coordinate system. And what you can see is, well, I can take a minus i hat vector here. I can take another minus i hat vector. I can take another vector, which maybe is not a full i hat vector. And I can add to it a j hat vector. And maybe not a full. Oops, I guess looks to me like I should have a j hat vector. And then maybe not a full j hat vector. So what does that mean? It means that I've been able to write v vector is equal to, let's say, minus 2.5 times i hat plus 1.5 times j hat. By definition, we're going to call these numbers the components of the vector. So these two numbers, vx and vy, are the components of the vector v. And in the way that I've constructed them there, you can see we have the vx is equal to two, minus 2.5 and vy is equal to plus 1.5. So um, how do we get those components? Um, if you just write down a vector, well, you can do the procedure that I, that I just did. You could also, um, let's take a different vector, maybe um, this vector. You could also um, do the procedure that's outlined in this paragraph here, um, which is to take a vector, place it at the origin of the coordinate system, and then project from the tip of the vector perpendicularly back to each axis. And this is very important. When you land at the axis, what you hit is a tick mark. Uh, so this tick mark here lands at, for example, 0 0.9 along the x-axis. What we say is that that is v sub x, if this is the v vector and v sub x is equal to 0 0.9. The tick mark that you land uh, on the y-axis is, notice, on the negative y-axis, and it looks like it's basically exactly at minus 3. So v sub y is equal to minus 3.0. So we find that the x and y components are these tick marks here. You might be tempted to think about this as the y component and this as the x component, but those two things are lengths. They don't represent uh, the positive or negative aspect of the components. So you want to think about the components of a vector exactly in the way that I just did as being the, um, the tick marks that you land at when you project back from the tip of the vector. So. Um, we can write this vector, as we said before, as vx i hat plus vy j hat, which would then be uh, 0 0.9 i hat minus 3.0 j hat. But we're almost always going to make it more convenient for ourselves and say that v is equal to the pair of numbers 0 0.9 comma minus 3.0. Uh, so that's a representation of the vector in terms of a coordinate system. Now, of course, in order to do that, you have to have the, the coordinate system that you picked on the page. Otherwise, these numbers don't mean anything. Um, these numbers are relative to the directions that you've chosen for your coordinate axes. Um, now let's look at how the addition and scalar multiplication um, uh, affects these components that we've talked about. Uh, 
So um, let's just do it in variables first, and then we'll do uh, some examples down below. Um, we said that we can write a vector as a pair of numbers. And in particular, we can write the a vector as ax comma ay, and then we can write the b vector as bx comma by, and we can write the c vector as cx cy. How do you add these things together? Well, if you go back and you look at the way that those vectors were were graphically added together, you'll see that the x and the y parts of each vector are completely independently added. So the result of this will be ax plus 2bx minus cx comma ay plus 2by minus cy. You see that we add the x's separately from the y's. And if we have a scalar multiplying out front, you just bring that in and multiply both components by it. So you notice this became, I didn't do it, but we can write it here, this became 2bx comma 2by. Now does that make sense? We said that when you multiply a vector by a number, you, you lengthen it. And yes, if you increase the two components by a factor of two, then that will also increase the length by a factor of two. So this is a way of, of writing a vector equation. Uh, there's a sort of an easier way of writing a vector equation. Um, and we're going to deal with a lot of vector equations that are sort of of this form. One famous example, the one that's probably the most important for this course, is that the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration vector. That is a vector equation, and we're going to have to deal with it exactly using this type of mathematics. We'll come to that in, in a couple of weeks. Um, but we'll see some uh, even, even sooner. So we dealt with that one, which was uh, the velocity of the swimmer with respect to the Earth was equal to the velocity of the swimmer with respect to the river plus the velocity of the river with respect to the Earth. That's an equation of relative velocity that we'll come to uh, just in a couple of lectures. So um, how do we deal with those kind of equations? Um, well, we can, uh, we can either deal with them graphically, so we can try and add up the vectors graphically like we've already done, or we can deal with them algebraically. We can get numerical equations out of them. And as we saw above, um, these x and y parts are completely independent. So we don't have to keep them paired up like this. So the other way that we might write this is um, the R equation up above is actually two equations. There's an X equation and a Y equation. The X equation says Rx is equal to Ax plus Bx plus Cx, and Ry is equal to Ay plus By plus Cy. So you take the vector equation, which is often the physical law, it's the required starting point because physics is written in that language, and then you say, well, I know what to do with that. It just means that it's two equations. So I can draw myself a coordinate system, x and y, and then I can break it up into two equations which correspond to the vectors along each of those equations. And we'll do that. Uh, every time we deal with vector equations, which is almost every topic of this course. So you get pl plenty of practice. So um, let's do a, a quick example um, of finding coordinates. Um, so, uh, sorry, finding components. So um, I've given you two vectors here, and um, and I've also given you a coordinate system to work with, you might want to try it out yourself. So you might want to pause the video and uh, determine what the components of each of those vectors are. 
and then either do graphical addition of the vectors and find the complements of the result that you get, or you can use the components to find a result directly from the value from the answers to part one and part two. So if you want to take a take a break and try it out yourself, and I will start in just a moment. So let's find A first. Well, A is this vector. So to find the components, you take it and you place the vector with its tail at the origin. And then remember, to see the component, you just go from the tip and find the tick mark where it lands on the x-axis perpendicularly. That number is called AX. And then you do the same thing for the y. That number is called a y. So what do we find? We find that a, which is equal to a y, oops, a x comma a y, is equal to, well, if I just count it out, it looks like uh, I'm using the tick marks on the graph paper as 1. So it looks like it's uh, 3.5. And a y is maybe 1.6. Okay. Now b. Um, I can just move it over. Oops. Sort of getting in the way of my other things here. So b, if I do the same thing, this is going to be b y. And this number down here, this tick mark, is bx. Notice bx is a negative number. It landed on the negative side of the axis. By is a positive number. So I get b is equal to, and then we just count it out. Well, it's 1, 2. It's exactly minus 2. And uh, by is almost exactly maybe a little bit less than 4. So let's say uh, plus 3.8 for by. Now I could do graphical addition and then find the components of the resultant vector, but I don't need to because I already have the components of a and b, and we know that the sum a plus b is just equal to ax plus bx comma ay plus by. So what is that? Well, it's 3.5 plus minus 2, so that's 1.5, comma, 1 1.6 plus 3.8, that's 4, 5.4, 5.4. So where does that thing sit? Well, it's going to be somewhere um, 1.5 and then up 5.4 at this position here, just to the right of the by. And you can see that if I took this vector and I added it to ay, that's exactly where I would get. So graphical addition would have given us exactly the same result. Um, and a minus b well, that's going to be equal to ax minus bx. So that's going to be 3.5 minus minus 2.0. So that's plus 5.5. And 1.6 minus 3.8, so that's, oh geez, it's going to be a negative number. 3.2, 2.2, I guess it's minus 2.2. hate doing arithmetic. Uh, where is that one? Well, that one is going to be at 5.5 minus 2.2. Uh, and you can see that if you took this vector and added the opposite of this vector, and you would end up exactly right there. So that makes sense. One last section. Let's try and understand uh, how we get the magnitude of the vector from the components. So um, let's just draw a coordinate system. So every time I draw a coordinate system, I'm drawing the standard one, which has a horizontal x with the x direction pointing to the right and the vertical y uh, with the y pointing up. Um, in fact, you can draw those coordinate systems in any way that you want, and we'll talk about how that's useful uh, when we get to the applications of vectors. Um, but for now, let's just leave this here. Um, so if we have a vector, call it V, 
and it points like this, then based on that uh, analysis that we just did, this number is called Vx, and this number, this tick mark, is called Vy. We're interested in how the magnitude, the length of this vector, is related to this number and this number. But you can see that there's a triangle there. There's actually a few triangles. Let me just draw one of them. Uh, there's a triangle that has the length of the vector in the hypotenuse, so that is v magnitude, and then the sides of the triangle are the absolute value of vy and the absolute value of vx. So you can see, actually, this is interesting, um, these bars mean absolute value because vx and vy, these are just numbers, whereas these bars mean something slightly different. It means the magnitude of the vector, which is, by um, what we found here, Pythagorean theorem shows that magnitude of v squared is equal to absolute value of vx squared plus absolute value of vy squared, or magnitude of v is equal to the square root of vx squared plus vy squared. Um, uh, we don't need the absolute values in there because we're taking the square root. Um, so that's how you find the magnitude from the components. Um, the direction, uh, what we mean by direction, is just some way of indicating the way that it points, and you can calculate that from the coordinates. So usually what you do is you say, okay, I have an angle, and maybe we'll take this as an angle just because it's the non-standard one. So I can say there's an angle with respect to the y-axis, um, and because of the direction I've shown that angle, you can see um, if we called this north, you would say that that is a certain number of degrees east of north. So if this is north and east, then you start from the north direction, and you're going east, so this is an angle east of north. So let's try and find that. Well, there's a triangle there, so let's redraw that triangle. And um, I would recommend, this is going to come up over and over again, that you keep your coordinate system with the vector on it separate from the triangles. So you notice I, I redrew the triangle. I didn't try and draw a triangle right on the coordinate system. So I'd recommend that you always do that. So here it is. Uh, here's, well, it's not the same triangle, but it will give us the same kind of information. Here's the theta. Here's the magnitude of v. Here is absolute value of vy and absolute value of vx. So what does that tell us? It tells us that we can find um, the angle from tangent of theta is equal to vx over vy. Or solving that, doing algebra on it, um, the way that you do algebra on a, on a tangent function is you act with the inverse. And of course, you have to do it to both sides. So that tells us that theta is equal to the inverse tangent of vx over vy. And we say uh, east of north. That's the way that it goes. So that's how you find a direction from components. Again, it comes about from a triangle. This angle might not be the standard one. If you've taken a math class and you've looked at uh, coordinate systems and vectors on coordinate systems, the angle from the x-axis is often the angle of that direction. Um, you don't need to do that. As long as you've labeled an angle, so you show exactly what you mean by it, then you can just draw a triangle and you can calculate that there.